Fantastic. I'm Tim Entwistle, the uh, or from Royal Botanic Gardens uh, in Victoria, Australia, and I'm going to uh, look after this next panel session. And I'd like to invite my panel members to come up and sit, please, uh, along with Martin, who I've invited to stay with us. And as they do that, I'll just introduce the session. We're going to try and make this uh, a little bit more informal. So I've um, put our, our panel members under a little bit of pressure and we're going to give a little, a quick statement at the start and then uh, try and get a few questions in. So we'll see, see how we, we go. Uh, if I could summarise perhaps the last talk or maybe uh, the discussions around climate change generally, uh, the climate is changing despite perhaps not convincing the entire world. Plants are responding, but are we? So we know the climate is changing, we know the plants are responding, but are we as botanic gardens? And so there are many dimensions to that response. One is what do we do looking after our living collections themselves? How do we care for those? Then how do we respond to the local community and its needs? And then the bigger picture, how do we help mitigate, deal with, address the problem itself. So for a botanic garden, to me, there are, are multiple dimensions, which is why it's wonderful to have this uh, excellent panel assembled with us today. We have, uh, uh, I've got them, you've got them listed, yes, uh, at the top there. Christopher Dunn from Cornell Botanic Gardens, USA. Natasha Devere from the National Botanic Gardens of Wales. Richard Piacentino Pantini from the Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Gardens in the USA. We have William Sinear from K Botanic Garden in Haiti, and uh, Chris Cole from also from the Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria in Australia, where, where I'm from too. I'm going to kick off by asking each of our panel members, and they're not going to stand up. I, I worry when they stand up and come over here that they'll give you a lecture, so they're not allowed. They've been trapped in their seats. And uh, they're going to have to turn their microphones on though, that's the first step. And Christopher, you might get yours lined up and ready. And my question to each of them is, what are the three most important things a botanic garden can do to respond to climate change from, from your own perspective? And Christopher, you've been arguing strongly for the impacts of climate change on indigenous communities. And I'm interested very much in how botanic gardens respond to that, but not in a, a tokenistic way and how they can do something important. Christopher. Well, thank you, Tim, and good morning, everyone. I'd be delighted to do that. I want to set the stage a little bit, set the premise. We've heard a lot about climate change and the impacts that climate change has on invasive species, or that it has directly on agricultural systems and the like. But as, a, as climate change erodes and changes uh, plant diversity and changes plant distributions, plant phenology, it has strong implications for impacting indigenous groups through availab availability of plants for food, fiber, spiritual purposes, and the like. So a direct consequence of climate change in many parts of the world, particularly in coastal areas, islands, and high elevation areas, is a loss of cultural integrity as these indigenous groups and local communities find it more and more difficult to keep their traditional livelihoods alive. We see this with the collapse of agricultural systems too in various parts of the world where local communities are now being fragmented and, and fractured and we're seeing huge human migrations as a direct result. In the Arctic, we're seeing whole-scale landscape loss as the permafrost is melting, we're seeing cultures melt, uh, in a sense. Kivalina, the island nations in the Pacific are going, going underwater in the next hundred years, an entire country may disappear underwater. And so this is a, a global issue that's leading not just to some of the things that uh, uh, Martin was just talking about, but also has distinct consequences for human cultural diversity. So what can botanic gardens do as we see this loss of traditional knowledge and plants Etc. Well, there are a number of things. And I think if we're going to reverse the tide with respect to plants and natural systems, we cannot leave behind the cultures that are uh, directly impacted. You consider the fact that uh, of the 6,700 languages or so that are still spoken in the world, fully 50% are at risk of or extinction in the next 100 years. So some of the things that gardens can do, and this harkens back to yesterday's discussion with uh, in the, in the morning, that, that morning panel, uh, we need new stories to tell, or additional stories, I should say. We're very good at telling the taxonomic, evolutionary, and economic stories about plants, but we're not as good as we should be in telling some of the 
cultural significance and importance of, of these plants to indigenous and local communities. And that's a very simple thing to do with interpretation through public events and programs and the like. Another thing that we can do is to honor the geographic space in which we, that we occupy. So at Cornell, which is in New York, which used to be uh, land that was owned by the Cayuga Nation, there are things that we can do to reinterpret the biological and the cultural history of that landscape. And that, again, is something that is relatively straightforward to do. But, but it, gets, it gets to be a little more complex, however, when we want to more specifically and actively engage with native communities and indigenous people, because that has to be done with the basis of trust, respect, etc. So that becomes a little bit more difficult or challenging, but I think it's more important than just the uh, interpretation. I think we really need to make an effort to do that. Because if we're going to save the natural world, we have to do as much as we can to preserve the cultural integrity, languages, etc., of those peoples that co-evolved with that plant diversity. And there are other things we can talk about, too, if time permits, that are a little bit more specific. That's just a very general overview. And so I'll pass it back to you, Tim. Per perfect. Thank you, Christopher. Look, I, I might pass, make sure we get everyone a, a chance to speak first. So, Natasha, uh, moving from people and cultures to uh, insects, pollinators. You spoke about pollinators at the conference and the interconnections between animals and plants are obviously important now, but uh, potentially change under, under climate change. What would you say the three things that a botanic garden can do to respond, particularly in that area? So yeah, so the, the three areas um, that botanic gardens can really contribute to research um, on climate change. Um, first of all, and fundamentally, is, is safeguarding and understanding our genetic resources. Um, whether seed banks, gem banks, living collections, um, the species and the genetic diversity within them are the building blocks for a sustainable future. Whether it's habitat restoration, species uh, reintroduction, assisted migration or the search for novel crops, we cannot do any of that without understanding fundamentally the species and the genetic diversity within them. And this has long been the um, remit of botanic gardens. Um, so we need to know what they are, how they're doing. We also need to know how to grow them. Um, horticultural protocols and recording of those is critical. And we need to know this both within botanic gardens um, and in the wild. Um, I also wanted to make a plea for DNA barcoding, um, which is something which I've been involved with. Because I think increasingly we need to be able to do rapid bio inventory um, and to be able to identify things which are difficult or impossible morphologically. And DNA barcoding um, enables us to do that. Um, at the National Botanic Garden of Wales, we led the project that DNA barcoded um, the floor of Wales and working with the Royal Botanic Gardens of Edinburgh, we're DNA barcoding the rest of the UK. And that provides us with an amazing reference for a lot of research which can contribute towards climate change. Um, the second major area for botanic gardens um, in research is the botanic gardens as a research lab. Um, we have these amazing collections of species in the same conditions that we can use to do very detailed research. Um, and we saw in, in Martin's talk some lovely examples which will have been from botanic gardens. We have our herbarium collections which provide amazing longevity showing how plants have changed um, looking at historically what they were doing in past climates. Um, we also have our living collections and there is an amazing network of phenology gardens where we have the same species growing in the different conditions of those gardens and we look at leaf and bud burst um, in different areas. Um, at this Congress, I've been really interested to see the work that different gardens are doing to go beyond that and they're increasingly looking at modeling and looking at predictive futures um, using their gardens collections. Um, some of the work that we've done at the National Botanic Garden of Wales to use our botanic garden as a research lab that could contribute to climate change is our work on plant and pollinator interactions. Um, so we've had some examples this morning that as plants move, um, as their flowering times change, the chances of the animals, spirits such as pollinators, dependent on them, being able to move in sync, uh, might be very, very difficult. 
Um, so what we do at the Botanic Garden is um, we record all of our plant species, we record when they're in flower, and then we record what pollinators are visiting them. Um, we use DNA barcoding to do that. We DNA barcode the pollen on the bodies of pollinators or within honey to see what the pollinators um, are visiting. And we can use that to see, well, okay, pollinators use this particular plant in their environment, but they can also use this plant or this taxonomic group. So you might be able to use that to do assisted migration, um, looking at plants and their pollinators. Um, and then the final kind of area of research, which I think is really critical for botanic gardens, is our multidisciplinarity. Um, so we have collections of horticulturalists, scientists, educators, um, and making sure that the work we do in that area is as rigorous as possible um, is critical. I thought it was uh, lovely that the talk yesterday in the plenary by Jin Chin from Shishuan Bana. Um, where it was really evaluating the education program and doing scientific research upon that. Um, and I think we can do much more in the area of multidisciplinarity. We're well positioned to do that. Let's bring together horticulture, science, education, but also art and social science to be able to investigate and, and investigate possible solutions to, to climate change. Thank you, Natasha. That's wonderful. Um, Richard, you've argued in the past uh, for addressing the root cause, uh, perhaps rather than the symptoms, and I'm wondering how that uh, int gets interpreted through what we should do as botanic gardens. Thank you, Tim. Uh, yes, at Phipps, you know, we, when we look at climate change and such issues as uh, loss of biodiversity and loss of habitats, we really are trying to understand what is the root cause of these problems, and we believe that it has to do with the lifestyle issue, the way we live our lives. It also has to do with the fact that we're so disconnected from nature. You know, several years ago, I heard a statistic that said that if everyone in the world were to try to live like the lifestyle we live in the West, it would take seven planets worth of resources to do that. Well, that's obviously not possible. And it's our unsustainable use of natural resources and our exponential population growth is resulting in such things as climate change, loss of habitats, and biodiversity. So we need to change. And I also think it's a social justice issue because when you think about it, the only way that we could, um, sorry, we think it's a social justice issue because the only way we can sustain the lifestyle we have in the West is to keep the rest of the world in poverty. And that's not fair. So we need to reinvent the way we live in the West so that we can think about better ways that we can live more sustainably and be able to export those ways to the rest of the world. We also have to change because I don't care how big a wall you build around a, an endangered species or an endangered habitat, eventually desperate, hungry people are gonna breach that wall. I was really excited in uh, November of 2015 when all the countries, most of the countries around the world came together and signed the Climate, Paris Climate Agreement and then I was horrified in November of 2016 with the election we had in the United States. And I was further horrified to learn you know, that we're, the United States is pulling out of the World Climate Agreement. Um, so we've been very focused at FIPS in trying to understand, can we make significant changes in the amount of energy that we use? And since 2005, we've actually reduced our CO2 emissions by 90%. Uh, now, a lot of that has to do with the fact that we've switched our the steam cooperative that we got our steam from switched from coal to natural gas, but we did play an important role in having that happen. But we also went and looked at, are we actually making significant changes on campus in the way we operate? And since 2005, we've had a 56% reduction in the amount of energy and CO, CO2 we produce per square meter of building. We also offset all the, the electricity that we use by purchasing renewable energy credits, and we offset all the steam heat that we do use uh, with carbon offsets. And we've done the, the electricity from 2005 and all the carbon offsets from 2010. So, so the net effect of the carbon we produce from our heating and power is essentially zero. So we know uh, that it can, can be done. We've also, during this time, uh, built two net zero energy buildings. We're working on a third net zero energy building. And we, so, and so again, this is something we know it is possible to make significant changes to address such things as climate change. We also think it's important for people to uh, divest from fossil fuel investments. 
And we also need to recognize that we can't wait for governments to take action, uh, particularly in the United States, that we really need to make choices ourselves and we need to encourage all our visitors to make choices. And we're lucky in Pennsylvania that uh, we're allowed to choose our electricity provider. Uh, and so if you buy your electricity just off the grid without doing anything, it's, the chances are it's from mountaintop coal mining, a mountaintop removal for coal mining, and it's, and it's coal. Uh, but you can actually switch to wind power and it costs the same amount of money. So the first thing that we did was we encouraged our, we, we tried to educate our visitors, first of all, that it's possible to make this change. We also decided that we needed to make it this more accessible for them. Nobody knows what a ton of carbon dioxide looks like. So we, we put it in terms of how many uh, barrels of oil are, are, is produced, uh, carbon dioxide comes from when you burn a barrel of oil or a rail load car, a, tr a train load car of coal or a tanker truck of gasoline. And then we teamed up with a green electricity provider uh, who we sell memberships in bulk to and, it, and they set up a, a table in our conservatory and then any visitor who switches to green electricity while they're at Phipps gets a free uh, membership to Phipps. And so far we've had almost 1,200 people switch their electricity since we started this in January, which is pretty exciting. And then after a couple of weeks ago, after President Trump officially pulled us out of the Paris Climate Agreement, we lined our front walkway with 16 barrels of oil to show what the typical uh, Pennsylvania family, uh, how much carbon dioxide they produce uh, a year for powering their homes. And again, by showing people visually what kind of impact uh, they're having, they can see that they can make a difference. And collectively, we then show them that so far, all the people who have FIPS who have converted their electricity to green electricity have, uh, it's the equivalent of over 19,000 barrels of oil not being burned in a year. So uh, we think there's great potential in botanical gardens to demonstrate by example uh, that we can make changes. We think from this point of credibility, then we can encourage our visitors to make significant changes too. And I think we need to capitalize on the fact that we excel in connecting people to nature and that we ourselves need to adopt net zero energy goals and to lead by example. And I think if we do that together, we can change the world. Fantastic. Thank you, Richard. A little, a little more than three, but all incredibly worthy things to do. We're going to switch now to the uh, to uh, just put up a map to show where our, our, our next speaker is from. William, uh, we, we hear and we've heard through the week that the tropics are, are rich in plant diversity and poor in botanic gardens. What is it that a botanic garden in your region can do to uh, address and, and respond to climate change? Uh, just, I'll make sure your microphone's on. Each speaker to lean right into the microphone so we hear you clearly at the back. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. So I'm going directly to the Caribbean country which we see to show you how climate change can affect a country. If for me, the most important thing for a botanical garden is to find the most important issue and environment that related to the climate change and you try to see how you can solve it. So in the Caribbean, we are in deep in the sea. Every time there is a movement in the sea, they create hurricane, flooding, and when the land is moving, it creates earthquake. So that means in the Caribbean, we are in a region very difficult. So by being a region very difficult, the nature gives us a huge diversity of plants, more than 10,000 species of plants. But 71% of these plants are endemic. That means they are unique. So the nature didn't die by accident. They do it for a reason, but for more than 200 years, we destroy all of them. We replace them by exotic species, exotic species that doesn't have any relation with our soil to protect them. So what happened nowadays? The mountain that we consider as a as an asset for the for the Caribbean country, they are going down, and the sea try to goes up. So it's possible. Unfortunately, we are talking about species extension. We are talking about species and the red list. It's possible to talk about country extension, a country on the red list. So the most important thing for us nowadays is to try to fix our mess for more than 200 years. That means to 
conserve the species that we have and involve in restoration. That's what we can do, or we can do in the Caribbean country. But and globally, there are something else we can do. For example, nowadays, all the people are using what to be fast. We want fast food, we want our, transport, our transportation to be fast, but we want the nature to be as the same. We want the climate not to change. It's not possible, because the way we are living, the way we are acting is uh, different than the nature. The third thing I think we must do as a scientist and scientific who is working in botanical garden, it's communicate. People, with, uh, scientists most of the time, they don't communicate too much. We know what to do, but we leave the politician to say, to, to talk uh, on, your, uh, on our name. So I think nowadays we have to go and talk. Me personally, I'm going back to Haiti. I learned a lot of things. I want to go back to Haiti to tell to the people that the earthquake that's happened in 2010 will happen, probably happen again with the climate change. We had a hurricane last year that caused a lot of damage in the country. There it will happen again. The most important thing for us is to build our resilience. How? Because we can change the place we are. We have to live with the, them and we have to work out to, uh, to build our resilience for resisting to the climate change. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, William. <laughs> I, I, do like, I do like the fact that your first one was fix the mess, and I think that's a, a really good uh, message to take, take with us. Uh, finally, Chris, Chris Cole from, uh, from Melbourne in Australia, you spoke earlier this week about a, a landscape master plan, sort of res sorry, res responding to climate change with some of the same modelling as we've seen in the, the talk by Martin. Uh, I'm curious as to uh, what you see a botanic garden doing, both in your environment but also more generally actually in the garden with those living collections. Thanks, Chris. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, the first thing that uh, I recommend a botanic garden should do in response to climate change is to understand the primary impacts of the extreme climate change scenario as far into the future as possible for your garden location. In other words, define the problem, what is coming your way. And for Melbourne, this is up to three degrees hotter and 10% drier by the year 2070. We will also see extreme heat days over 35 degrees, increasing from 11 days to 24 days. An example of how we're currently dealing with these two primary challenges in Melbourne is as follows. Firstly, temperature. Having accurate plant collection database records is a critical first step. Recently, we have undertaken a climate vulnerability a risk assessment of each taxa within our garden, which is just over 8,000, to understand the scale of the challenges that we're faced with and what percentage of our collections are suitable for the future climate and what percentage require transitioning. We now know that 25% of the living collections will be vulnerable to the projected temperature increases of 2070. It's also important to understand the microclimates within a living landscape and how these existing landscape could be manipulated to better care for existing and new taxa. In addition to managing the living landscape, we are also continuing to develop an understanding of visitor comfort within the gardens. The provision of shade and shelter from the elements and how through landscape design we can enhance visitor experience. The other primary challenge for Melbourne is water security. Being able to irrigate the landscape and our collections into the foreseeable future is critical for Melbourne Gardens. The heritage character of the gardens and the aesthetic qualities that are an integral part of the design of the landscape must be maintained. There's been a strong focus at the gardens on integrated water management for the past 15 years and indeed since the start of the millennium drought we experienced in South East Australia around about the year 2000. We now have a highly sophisticated irrigation programming, delivery and monitoring system that enables us to accurately apply specific quantities of water to specific zones based on the moisture con content of the soil and the needs of the plants growing in those zones, keeping wastage to an absolute minimum. 
We're continuing to focus on alternative sustainable water supplies to irrigate the gardens. In 2012, we installed a stormwater harvesting program called Work in Wetlands, which captures stormwater from surrounding streets, diverts it into our four hectare lake system for treatment, storage, and application to our irrigation infrastructure onto the landscape. And this helps to reduce our reliance on potable water use for irrigation by up to 40%. The next stage for us is to become 100% non-reliant on potable water for our irrigation needs. This will be achieved by extracting up to 100 million litres per annum of non-saline water from the adjacent Yarra River. The second thing I think we should be doing as Botanic Gardens is to develop a strategic response to climate change. And for those of you that saw my talk earlier in the week, you will know that Melbourne Gardens have developed a landscape succession strategy, which we launched in March 2016. And it's also available on our website, so if you're interested, please do check that out. It's important that such a plan is integrated into the organisation's strategic planning framework, and there is a reference to alignment with such a strategy in other high level documents like master plans, living plant collection plans, strategic tree and water plans. Our document has five specific targets and 25 quantitative and qualitative actions and will guide us through a 20 year period. And I'm confident that by 2036, we will have a resilient landscape capable of withstanding the extreme climatic projections of 2070 and beyond. Thirdly, make sure it's a collaborative effort get everyone on board in the organisation so that adaptation to climate change becomes an organisational priority that is well understood and embedded in the culture and language of all staff, from horticulturists to collection curators, science, education and marketing, right through to the CEO and the board. Proactively share information and build networks with other botanic gardens and relevant land managers. And don't be too concerned if you don't have all the answers right now. Action, not procrastination, is required. And finally, just 3.1, <laughs> communicate the primary benefit as widely as possible. For us, it is safeguarding the provision of educational, recreational, conservation, and scientific values of the Melbourne Gardens for future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Now, I'm going to open it up in a moment for, for general questions. I want to make sure you, that we have a chance for that. I want to lead off with one question to anyone on, on the panel. And it might be a slightly odd one. I, I read in the, the Guardian, yesterday's Guardian, that we produce 460 billion plastic bottles a year. So 2016, there were 460 billion plastic bottles. Just for those of you who have got your bottle in front of you, yes, you can hold it up and proudly. Uh, and by 2050, the oceans will contain more plastic than fish by weight. So, so 2050, there will be more plastic in the oceans by weight than there will be fish. And that plastic, and that this article said, plastic bottles will be, a, will be as serious a problem as climate change within a few years. So my question is, how do we as botanic gardens and as individuals weigh up these various problems and issues and uh, you know, there, there are so many overlaying threads, so how do we uh, prioritise climate change in the face of a, a huge range of other environmental issues? Anyone who'd like to comment? Uh, this yeah. is Richard. Yes. Uh, Richard. Well, I, I don't think we should ignore the plastic bottle problem while we focus on climate change. I think climate change is the biggest issue we have to deal with, but we, we clearly need to start thinking about plastic and there's absolutely no reason why any of our gardens should be having any kind of plastic disposables. We need to stop that right away, get rid of the bottled water and all the disposable plastic for, for food service. Yeah, I'm, I, and I don't want to divert, I, it's a very good point, and I didn't want to diverse into plastic, but it's, it's quite, quite legitimate. But it is, it is hard to actually decide as a botanic garden, I mean, clearing of vegetation, I would suggest, is also been a major issue over the years and climate change is just exacerbating that, would be my, my feeling. Yeah. Okay. We're we're all comfortable with that. I've summed up their their views entirely. Um, now I'd like to get a couple of uh, questions from the floor. Anything that uh, you'd like to ask, please. This is your chance to contribute. Uh, Gunter Fischer from Hong Kong. 
I have a question um, you heard this morning. Obviously, uh, vegetation is, uh, zones are going to shift because of a change in climate. So botanic gardens located in different vegetation zones, what would be their role to assist that kind of migration? Yeah, that, that might be one. I mean, William, you'd have a view on that perhaps, or, or Martin, I, I'm sure too. But. William, do you think um, you know, where the botanic garden is placed is important? The first thing is uh, you have uh, to, know, to go back to look for the information that we have before and uh, have investigate to have information to, to see how we can build it again. Um, because uh, if uh, the vegetation is uh, shifting, so you cannot, it's our, our world to see how we can, uh, we can propose something to do, uh, to, uh, to do it. Because uh, we can uh, leave it uh, like that. If you leave it like that, some new species or exotic species can come and make uh, anything. For me, it's really restoration. Thinking about restoration and something else that restoration is not a question for three or five plants. There is a lot of things involved. You have to know about phytosociology, the relation that between the plants. Uh, you have to involve an ecology. A lot of things happen when you are talking about our restoration. And uh, this is what now I'm trying to learn and help people to understand, to see, because most of the projects that happen in my country they're just uh, coming with uh, some one species or two species uh, to do with forestation for the country. And now we must talk mostly about the restoration. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, it's James Searson from St. Andrews Botanic Garden, Scotland. Um, one of the most powerful images um, that I've ever seen in, in, in uh, conservation is the uh, satellite image of the line, the borderline between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And there's this, this stark uh, contrast in, in vegetation. And it really is, I, I guess, the, the result of um, historical government's um, policy, uh, things at government level, um, and, and uh, those type of issues. So I think my question is, and, and I don't feel it's really been addressed, how do we as Botanic Gardens leverage our global audience, which is vast, to achieve direct policy change and advocacy at the government level um, to deal with some of those policy issues um, in addition to our local communication, education, modeling kind of actions. Yeah, who'd like to address that? Here, please, Natasha. Um, I think just being here is doing it. I, I think something which has been a common theme throughout the conference is the importance of us as a network of botanic gardens um, and dealing with that as a network of gardens under the secretariat of, of BBCI. Um, and I think we can do even more in that area um, to look at the common goals and the things which we need to face and how we can collectively address those internationally. I think William, you alluded to that as your third point. So I have the chance uh, to study in Dominican Republic and living in Haiti, so I know the story. And I'm a forester. I study forestry in Dominican Republic. So they did a lot of good works in the Dominican Republic because uh, it's uh, the government decision to invest in reforestation. But as I study in Dominican Republic, I will tell you that uh, most of the investment are private investment too. They are planting pine. So there are a lot of, Dominican Republic It's green, some parts are green, but that's not mean it's a sustainable. Because now there is a big challenge with uh, people who produce wood to sell, and uh, they don't give up doing that. But Haiti has a lot of uh, history, political history, changing government from uh, 19, uh, 1986. So before that, Haiti has, uh, I would say, some forest cover or vegetable cover. But now it is by changing all the time. We don't have really government that really have a real plan, a long, long term plan to say, I want to invest and uh, to see how we can change the image of the country. Because it is not because they, they don't want, sometimes they don't know. Because I know something, and today I'm here. It's a because I participate in a lot of conferences and seminars. So now I am aware about what happened. So if today 
or tomorrow I will be in some position in the country, but sometimes I don't want to be in politics. And uh, in the position of the country, I will tell them exactly what they have to do. As I say, the role of the political government is convinced to influence, to communicate. So I will keep communicate, I will keep influence if I would be in the government. So we have some representative from Haiti and the government here. I hope they understand and they will talk to the government to see how we can change because Haiti is a real disaster in the environment and we want to work on that by the next 20 years to make a difference. Thank you. And, and look, Richard, I wouldn't mind just a very quick comment from you. You were talking about addressing the root cause and a lot of the things your garden is doing uh, to be responsible. Is, is part of the root cause policy, government, I don't know how much you can comment on that, but what's your view on that? Well, obviously, I think um, we, have, we have allowed governments to take over the control of the conversation, conversation and say, we keep waiting for governments to it, uh, implement policies that are going to address some of these issues. And my point is that we can't wait for the governments anymore. We need to start doing these things ourselves. Okay. So that's yeah. going to be my answer. No, thank you. Okay, uh, further questions. Do yell out if I don't catch your hand. It's, it's shiny up here or bright. Thanks. Uh, yeah, me, right? Yes, you. Okay. <laughs> Matt Sobstrom again in Sweden. Uh, I have a question about bioinformatics in the future and the changing climate. Uh, because during the last couple of hundred years, we, we've gathered quite a lot of uh, herbarium material and other types of collections, but uh, in some parts of the world, at least where I am uh, uh, studying, uh, we can see a decline in, in the collection of, of uh, common species, uh, and we, we're more focusing on, 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 on other areas in the, in the world. But uh, what's your comments? Uh, on, on, on the risk that we don't have any information about the shifts that will take place and is taking place right now in the future so that we can study what actually happened and not only what we think will happen as, as we saw this morning. Chris Cole, I wonder if you might just comment from your point of view you know, in accessing data and trying to use the data that's around. Sure, thanks Tim. Um, yeah, it's something that we've uh, found to be quite challenging, but we've recently undertaken a research project with the University of Melbourne using online data, data sources such as uh, GBIF and BioClim, and that's the best we've come across to date, to be honest. Um, it's not perfect, but at least it gives us a baseline um, set of data to work with. And indeed, these projections may well shift over time, but at least uh, we've got a starting point. Uh, Christopher, I might just bring you, I know it's not directly related as a question, but I'm thinking in terms of cultural um, diversity and, and the issues, does that get, uh, if, if we focus purely on plant species and, and on data, does that take us away sometimes from the big important issues or not? Well, the, the biocultural issue is a big one. I think it's, it is the biggest issue in my view. Um, we can talk a lot about impacts of climate change on natural systems, but we forget too often that the cultural diversity of the world has co-evolved in a sense with that rich biological diversity. And if we're going to survive as a, and it's pu puzzling to me why as much as we must be concerned about the loss of biological diversity, the direct impact that it's having on, on our cultural integrity and diversity is, is enormous. And we bemoan monocultures and agricultural and horticultural systems, but we are at risk of becoming a sort of a cultural monoculture, as it were. And so I think this is a, a big issue that we need to deal with. And uh, going back to herbaria and, and that, that's hugely important in the biocultural realm as well. Looking at changes in phenology, we can use that to help indigenous cultures recalibrate how they res respond to environmental cues. They're often used to determine, like when a particular tree or a shrub is flowering, that's a cue, perhaps, the, or an indicator, a phenological indicator that it's the fish are running in a stream or something else is happening in the system that is of critical importance to that culture for their livelihood. So as the phenology changes, then that 
those links are now broken, so we can use the herbarium data too to help recalibrate these ecological calendars within, for indigenous groups. So that's a little bit of an aside, but I thought I'd no. put that in there as well. Look, and look, it's a, and it's a lovely point to end on. I think it's a, a big subject, and I would thank first of all our, our speakers, Christopher, Natasha, Richard, William, Chris, and also those who have been involved in the discussion from the floor. Thank you very much.